Okay, so I uh, apologize for the little bit of a late start, and I apologize for a couple of you that I missed grade sheets. I don't, I don't exactly know what happened, but I'll figure it out. Um, so I, I threw up this slide at the beginning when you first get a grade sheet. For those of you that have never been in one of my classes and never gotten a grade sheet before, so that we can kind of walk through it. If you've heard me, if you're in my uh, other class, then you've already heard me go through this anyway. Or no, you haven't yet, have you? Um, so anyway, you'll hear me again when, when that time comes. So I want to talk through kind of the grade sheets that you understand, because there's an awful lot of information that gets thrown at you. But I throw everything that I have at you so that if you feel like I missed something or whatever, remember I have 90 of you, so I have to keep track of everybody. And, and there's a lot of individual little things. Uh, so up at the top, uh, we have the exercises. Uh, these grades were done prior to anything that you did last class. Um, so I was finishing up. If you have a hole that's right at the end, like if, if I say that you haven't turned in exercise 109 and you did, but it's right at the very end of the grading, assume that I missed it in the grading and that I'll catch it next time. If it's further back in the grade sheet, then that's a problem and that's what we want to talk about. So up at the exercises up at the top, the top row is the class average. The next row down is your particular score. Basically on exercises, sorry, I can't quite reach, right? Basically on exercises, you did it, you get 100%. If you didn't do it, you get a zero. It's very straightforward, OK? So if it's a zero and it's highlighted in yellow and it's not, you know, if it's 109 back somewhere in there, that's where you start to say, wait a minute, why did I miss that? Sometimes you forget to post it or, or whatever. We just want to make sure that that gets taken care of, OK? Below that, we have kind of your summary grades with your assignments. You can see your grade for assignment 101 here. Okay. But if we look here, this is kind of a better indicator of assignment 101. Assignment 101, grade, and then there'll be comments about your grade. Obviously, I blurred it out so that you can't see whoever's grade sheet this is. This was a couple years ago's grade sheet. Um, anyway, so you'll get whatever I wrote about comments. Part of the reason it takes me as long as it does for grading is because I write individual comments for every one of your assignments. Those comments are not cut and pasted. Every once in a while, there's two that are so similar that I'll cut and paste and then add a little bit more. But I would say 90 plus percent of the time, they're unique comments for each individual one of your assignments. Um, and that's, that's part of it. You deserve that feedback. So that's part of why it takes me a while to grade. Uh, that'll show up here. Obviously, as you get grades for 102 through 106, more and more comments will show up in that, in that section. Um, as we come across here, there's a little box called comments. Um, the upper number here is the number that I think you should have. And I forget on your grade sheets right now, I think it's 20 something. 21. 21. So I think you should have 21 as of when I did the grading. Uh, it'll give you whatever your total is. If you're higher than 21 in that example, you have 100%, but you don't get credit for extras. Okay? However, if you missed a few down the road in the semester, those will count for you. Okay. The other thing about comments is a lot of times um, they are way overweighted right now. So let's say you're missing, you only did half the comments so far. You might be failing the class. That's not something to worry about. The, the fact of the matter is right now the comments are worth 5%. You've only had one assignment. It's worth 7%. Right? They're about the same. At the end of the semester, you have comments worth 5%. You have 95% of the rest of your grade is something else. Does that make sense? So it's weighted too heavily right now, so don't panic about it. The other thing about comments is it's not a permanent number. So I don't say, oh, as of this date, you had this many comments. Okay? It's at the end of the semester, how many comments did you have? Did you achieve the comment goal? Okay? So if you're behind, catch up. No big deal. If you continue to be behind and you continue to wait and wait and wait to do comments, you will get to the end of the semester and have to do 50 or 75 comments. And it will take you hours and hours and hours to do it. So it's much better to do it as you go along, three comments a day, than to wait. Okay? But you can, if you really want to wait until the end of the semester to write all of your comments, you technically can do that, though I wouldn't recommend it. So the comments is, is something that you want to pay attention to. Okay? Um, this box with the dashed line around it gives you whatever the class average grade was. In this case, it was an 87. Like I said, this was a couple years ago. The average grade was a B. Right? This person had a 99% which is an A. OK? Does that make sense? Yeah? So hopefully this is relatively clear. Again, lots of information um, to take into account. If you feel like you don't understand something that's on there, let me know. If you turned something in and I didn't mark it as being turned in, as long as it's not like assignment 109 or exercise 109 or something that I just probably didn't see, 
Um, if you did it, please let me know. I make mistakes. Part of the reason I give you the grade sheets is you can correct my mistakes in, in case I do make a mistake. The last thing I want is to have a mistake on your final grade. So I try very hard to give you feedback so that you know um, if there are any mistakes ahead of time. Are there any questions about the grade sheets? No? If your grade is not where you think it should be or not where you want it to be, don't panic. It's not the end of the world. It's probably because you haven't done enough comments yet. At this stage in the semester, that's generally what it is. Uh, remember, you can do a regrade for Assignment 101 if you want. If you are unhappy with your grade and you want to submit it again, that's fine. I won't do the regrade until the end of the semester. So it won't, your grade will stay the same until the, the, the end of the semester, and then I'll go back and look at it if you want to do that. OK, so today we're going to talk about typography, uh, which is essentially fonts and types. And I'd like to, um, to begin this whole lecture um, by kind of discussing something that I would recommend that each of you on your own time go watch. How many people have seen the uh, commencement address by Steve Jobs at Stanford from about mm, 2004, 5, 6, somewhere in there? Anybody seen that? OK, so you all have homework. And that is to go watch it. It's not very long. It's like 15 minutes. Okay? He talks a lot about typography in this particular speech. And I think it's very interesting. So you guys know who Steve Jobs is? Was? Yes, maybe. Okay. Uh, very, very influential designer in the world of things that we see and, and things that we interact with. He attributes almost all of his success to a class that he took in typography when he was kind of floating around the idea of college before he dropped out and became a really rich man. Um, and a lot of it had to do with this one class in typography. Because type is one of the most beautiful design things that's out there, it's something that we interact with on a daily basis, and it's so often put to the side as unimportant. And I spend a whole lecture talking about this because it is that important, and it is something that you should always be considering as you do your design work. Okay, so let's start with a definition of terms of typefaces. So we have several different things called style. And style is something that's generally available under the edit menu. Um, and you're probably familiar with, you know, control B to make something bold or control I, you know, this is in the, the world of Word. Um, and we have styles, we have regular, we have italic, and we have bold, right? They're generally used to provide some kind of a contrast or an emphasis on a particular piece. Maybe you're, you're writing your English paper or your history paper and you have to do a little citation. You make the little citation in italics so that you know where it came from. Maybe you're quoting something and you make that in, uh, in italics. It's, it's meant to be um, something to, to kind of highlight a particular piece of your document. If you can, you want to choose the typeface, or excuse me, the style from within the typeface family. Right? And you may have noticed this, and you may not have noticed it. The, the traditional way that we, we work with typefaces is we just go to the edit menu and we say, make it bold or make it italic. Okay? That's not the same thing as picking Times New Roman italic versus Times New Roman regular. Okay? And I'll show you an example next. Okay? So this is a, an example in two different fonts of your kind of classic uh, operating system adjustment. So we have the word hazy normal, right? Then we have kind of an italicized version of it. This would be control I, the normal way of italicizing things, right? Then we have the bold version and we have a bold italic version, okay? Down here we just have an italicized piece of text. Looks reasonable, right? Slanted over, it's okay. Now let's look in contrast to what the version that is designed by the typeface designer looks like. Okay? So we take the regular one, obviously it's the same. The first column here is the same. We take this next one, it's very different, right? wouldn't you say? So the italicized version adds a little bit of extra flair. Look at the bottom of the Z with the little curl. Right? It's just a little bit of extra, but it really changes our perception and our, the readability or legibility of that particular line of text. Right? Similarly, the bold version has a lot fatter strokes. It's not uniformly thicker. Right? If we compare this to this, Basically, all the operating system did was, was thicken the, the lines, kind of in an even manner. If we look at this, they really thickened this line, and they didn't do anything to that line. Right? So the bold is, again, a design typeface. Okay? Let's look at the bottom one here. Here's the actual italicized version of the same font. 
So instead of just slanting the letters over, they've actually changed the design of the font. And that makes a big difference. So if you can, within the, the font family, you're, instead of choosing um, you know, control I or, or edit bold with that, and I should say, some operating systems automatically substitute um, so that you don't have to do it. But it's, it's better practice to make sure you go in and specifically say this, this particular font in you know, Times New Roman italic. Right, that's the right font to choose. So weight is a relative lightness or darkness of the letter forms themselves. Right? It's marked by changes in the line width. So we have a light, a medium, and a bold. Right? The best fonts will have light, medium, bold, light italic, medium italic, bold italic. Right? So we have this great combination of designed fonts. Right? And that's considered to be a font family. Width returns, refers to different variations in the typeface width. Right? So we might have a condensed version, a compressed version, or an extended version. Anybody ever use the extended version to make your paper a little bit longer? Maybe. You guys don't want to admit to it. It's OK. I don't, I don't ever ask you to write a paper, so it's, you can freely admit that. Right? I remember those days. It's kind of like when you change the point size right? up from 12 point to 13 to get a little extra. Right? Doesn't make a difference. We can tell. Right? So x height refers to the height of lowercase letters without ascenders or descenders, which basically the easiest way to think about that is the height of an x. Right? It's just kind of a basic letter. Um, let's look at it in, in uh, oh, I'll do one more slide, and then we'll look at the, uh, the example here. Cap height refers to the, the height of a capital letter instead of the height of a lowercase letter. Right? So x height and cap height vary by which typeface you're choosing. Okay, that can change. And the baseline is where we measure from. So if we look at this graphic, I apologize, it's a little bit blurry here. Right? We have a baseline that runs all the way across at the bottom of the, the letters here. The x height is the same height right, as a lowercase letter, or an x. Right? Then we have a cap height. That's the height of a true capital letter. We have something called a small capital. I'll talk about that in just a second, which is a capital letter that's the height of an, uh, the x height. Okay? And then we have ascenders and descenders, right? The tops of the Bs, the bottoms of the Gs, and the Ps, and the Qs, and that sort of thing that go below the baseline or above the X line. Counters are white spaces located inside and around letter forms. I think I can go back here. Counter here, that's a counter, that's a counter, this is a counter. Okay? So it's space in and around the letter forms. It affects legibility and readability, and also the density of the text. If you have a really thin font at a really large size, right, it can have what's called an open counter. It has too much space for the thickness of the letters, and it can be kind of difficult to read or, or, or challenging to work with. The opposite is true for really bold fonts. So for example, errors here. It's a little bit hard to read at first glance because there's so much space around those letters. It's a thin font with lots of space, right? The, the small text here and errors in bold is a little bit hard to read because the letter forms are so big and the counters are so small, right? So it's some combination of the two that gives us good readability and legibility. Small capitals are complete sets of uppercase letters that are the same height as a, as a lowercase letter, this, the, the, the x height of a particular font. Um, they're used when large capitals would draw too much attention, right? So let's say you're, you're typing up your English paper or your history paper, and you need to use some all capitals. Like let's say you were doing um, you know, the, the, the he chiseled heading above a Roman building, like the Pantheon or something like that. Um, if you were doing that and you did it in the full cap height letters, and it was in the text or the body of your, your paper, it would be just too big and too bold. Right? So by switching to the small capitals, it's not quite as bold, but it is, in fact, the, the title, and it has all the capital letters that you need. So it's a good kind of combination. A lot of times on the spines of books, you see that, um, or they'll use it as well. Acronyms, abbreviations, those kinds of things are also great. Lining and non-lining figures. Figures basically refer to numbers. Right? In the, the world of typography, we, we talk about numbers as figures. Um, lining figures are a set of numbers with the same width and height as full capital letters. Non-lighting figures are essentially numbers that have ascenders and descenders. And so sometimes it's easier to actually look at this in form. So lining figures, full cap height, 
one, two, three. Non-lining figures are the same as an X height. So we have a small one, we have a small two. The three goes below the baseline. Right, you've probably seen this before, like in a Garamond font or something like this, it has this kind of a three. Um, it's great for using numbers in, in a paragraph of text. So if you need to, to have a set of numbers, um, again, just like the capital letters, if you had the, the, the true lining figures with the big cap heights, they'd stand out in a paragraph of text. So if we have the non-lining figures, they don't stand out as much, which can be an advantage. Okay. Ligatures are specially designed characters produced when combining two or three letters together. Um, they're replacing letters that would otherwise collide. So if we look at these, uh, the upper row here are the most standard set of ligatures. Most fonts, if they were designed by some kind of a typeface designer, have these built in. So if you type F, F, and I in a row, the font automatically combines those together. So here are the, the ligatures off. F and I, see how we have the extra dot kind of next to the top of the F, right? Or F, F, and I. These are separate Fs, okay? This is the, kind of the same thing as when you, when you write by hand and you have two Ts together, you cross both Ts. You don't do two separate little lines to cross the Ts. The, this is essentially the digital form of that. So, right? so the F and the I combine together, the F, the F, and the I combine together. The I goes away and it's the end of the, the, the tail of the, the top of the F that becomes the dot for the I. You kind of get the idea. Okay? Discretionary ligatures, this is kind of the next set, are fancy ways of combining letters. Depending on how you're, you're, you're working with this particular typeface, you may or may not want them on. Some fonts let you do it, some fonts don't let you do it, um, but I include that just so that you know what they are. Um, in some cases, they're just, they're kind of nice, right? So in this case, the Q, the tail of the Q changes a little bit, which is nice. Some of these are a bit much, right, with that. But it is what it is. Uh, and then these contextual ligatures are very, very subtle. The best typefacers uh, or, or type designers in the world are going to use this kind of stuff. The expectation that you would use it is not very high. It's extremely subtle, right? The difference between the V and the Y here, they kind of collide, right? A little bit of extra space right there. So just really subtle. Um, but somebody that's spending an awful lot of time would make those kinds of adjustments. So how about choosing the right font? Anybody ever done a poster for, say, 121 and had Daniel or Marlon say, uh, why don't you try this again with a font that, that matches? Maybe, right? Probably because you used Times New Roman and you were doing like a Mondrian poster or something, right? They didn't match up. So we have to choose the right font. You have to think about what is the longevity of the piece, right? How long do you want this to exist? Is it timeless? Is it not timeless, et cetera? The best example I can have of this, and this is again probably dating myself, you guys ever see Lord of the Rings, the movies, right? I know that, that this is like ancient history for most of you. You were probably not even born yet. It's scary. Uh, anyway, so they used in the beginning of that, uh, the, the little, I don't know, the little font that was shown when they were doing little titles and, and whatever, was a font called Papyrus. Okay, so this is circa maybe 2001-ish, okay? Papyrus, okay, that was the font that they chose and whatever. If you go back and watch the movies now, you look at that font, you're like, oh, it's so overused, right? Because it became this really big fad in kind of 2002 to 2005. Like, this papyrus font ended up being like on every menu that you looked at in a restaurant. And it was just, it was way overused. And now it looks really dated because it was just, tied to that particular time period, that particular movie. Uh, and so when you're designing something with type in it, you want to think about if you're using a particular font, is it going to go out of style because it's really in right now and it won't be really in down the road, right? There are certainly fonts that are very classic that will not go out of style. And so you could use those to get uh, a little bit further. What is the purpose of the piece? Right? If it's something that you're, you're going to want to, let's say it's a book and somebody's reading it, you would probably pick a font that is a serif font so that it's easier for the people to read versus a sans serif font that doesn't have the extra little um, tails that make it more difficult to read. So you want to think about what's the purpose of this particular piece. Is it innovative? Is it outdated? Right? This maybe has to do more with display fonts than anything else. Is it traditional or is it too conservative for what you're trying to, to to show in your particular design. Sometimes the best thing to do is to compare two fonts side by side. 
Right? You take the same document. You compare one font, you compare another font, and you say, which one works better? Which one looks better? Uh, and sometimes that's the easiest way to decide. You think about readability. What is the emotion that's evoked by the particular font? How legible it is? Right? Does it reflect the, the needs of the client or the viewer? That kind of thing. Right? So for example, here we go. Two side by side. The heading of each of these is the same, Clarendon bold. And the font is different for each of them. Okay? So now in this particular case, you can read each of these, but one might be slightly easier to read, one might be slightly more difficult to read. Right? Um, and so there are two different styles of fonts, and by comparing them side by side, you can kind of feel which one seems right for this particular piece. Uh, I just think this is a fun image. It's called the Periodic Table of Typefaces, obviously a play on the Periodic Table of Elements. Um, but it's kind of a fun way of looking at uh, kind of simple to complex. Uh, in terms of fonts and, and kind of how they work together. Um, obviously getting down to the old English at the bottom right corner. Uh, and so it's just kind of an interesting one to look at. I like this one as well. So you need a typeface, right? And this one's pretty fun. So you can say, I'm designing a logo. We come into logo. It says, do you like sans serif or serif, right? And depending on what you do, let's say I like serif, we come over here and it say, says, how does the word semi-sans or semi-serif sound? Either good or bad, and then you keep following along here and it puts you into a particular font. Right? So it's kind of entertaining. It's worth playing around with. The image quality is not the best, uh, but if you look at it online, it's a really big file, so you can, you can actually follow through. But it's kind of fun to see what, what your uh, font choice should really be based on your project. Okay? The other thing is, you can use a single font and just do variety in the family of the font. So for example, you have a basic font, then you have an italicized version, you have a bold version, and through the combination of those, you don't really need any other versions. You don't need any other fonts. Or you can combine two typefaces together. You could take uh, one typeface, say a serif typeface, and combine it with a sans serif typeface. And the combination of the two can be really, really good. Okay? The key is that you want them to have the same X height if you're going to combine them. If they have different X heights, they won't combine nicely together. Um, Big Caslon and Myriad Pro are examples. Sabon and Syntax are good. Um, if, you're, if you're struggling to pick, if you pick one font and then you Google font pairing uh, of you know, Helvetica with whatever, um, it, will, it will bring up a list of these are fonts that kind of work together. Um, it's easier than trying to determine if the X heights are the same uh, on an individual basis. So sometimes, you know, best fonts that go with syntax, and it'll bring up a list of fonts. Um, it's sometimes nice. You just want to make sure that they actually go together. And if they go together nicely, the combination of the two can be very, very good. There are also things called display fonts or script fonts. Uh, let's say you were doing a wedding invitation. Right, or you got a wedding invitation, they always use the calligraphy script fonts with lots of fancy tails and all that kind of stuff that make it almost impossible to read. That's the nature. It's supposed to be formal, so it's a script font. There are fonts that do that. Um, one of the entertaining things about some of the best of those kinds of fonts is the little tails. You know, these are the fonts that have, you know, they're doing like a W, and it's like, you know, or whatever as part of the font, right? Because they have all these little tails and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, the best fonts, these little tails and stuff will change depending on what's happening and what letters are co combining together. Anyway, so those are script typefaces versus um, you know regular typefaces. It's hard to write, say, your whole English paper in a script typeface. It would be very difficult for your English teacher to read, and she'd probably send it back to you and say, uh, change the font. Okay. Um, but they're good for titles, display fonts, you know, maybe the heading in a, in a particular poster, something like that. So designing with type. Legibility and readability. Okay? So if we want really good communication out of our piece, we have to pay attention to two things. One is legibility, or the recognition of individual letter forms themselves. Can we, can we distinguish the letters such that we can read this particular um, these particular words or these particular letters. Readability is how the typography is presented to the viewer as words, lines, and paragraphs. Okay? So legibility is individual letters. Readability is 
you know, words, sentences, paragraphs, and kind of the flow, and is it easy to read or not, okay? And so depending on what, what font you pick and the, the, the kerning and the tracking and the spacing are gonna make a difference. And we'll talk about what all those are. So let's look up here. Legibility, right? Arial's pretty easy to read at this, at this distance. Obviously this is a little bit blurry in image, so I apologize for that, right? And this mesquite font is really pretty challenging to read, okay? But if you were doing a, a heading for like a backyard barbecue or something, the mesquite font might be appropriate. But if we were writing a big long paper in it, it would be very difficult to read. Readability, right, is about the, the words and the paragraphs together, right? And so in this case, uh, in, in this, um, this has some serif, so we've got little tails in it, makes it a little bit easier to read in the flow. We come over here, the letter Gothic here is a little bit harder to read because it doesn't have those tails. You have to concentrate a little bit more uh, on what you're seeing. Context uh, has to do more with the, the relative sizes, right? Um, and so you're not, you're, you're, you've got the nice bold text as a headline, a little bit larger, not for the overall paragraph because it's too much density, too much black. Uh, and context, I think, is, is a creative one because it has to do with if you're writing a formal, like a, um, you know, a financial paper, you would want it to be in Times, not Comic Sans or Cartoon font, so you have to think about what you're trying to, to portray with it and make sure that you pick something that's appropriate. Okay? Objective representation is a practical and straightforward strategy. It's clear, ordered, hierarchical, right? easy to follow. Um, subjective rep representation is the opposite. Right? It's conceptual, interpretive, and you might end up with something like this that can be very interesting, right? but at the same time it's playing with, with, with type. Uh, and it's presenting something that's very interesting in a graphic sense, but it's much harder to understand what's happening and, and, and what's reading. Either can be very successful for your um, lecture series poster that you're going to be doing, but you might want to think about you know, what you're trying to portray in this. Okay? It's usually heavily focused on a theme or an idea uh, that you're trying to have come across. You want to think about macro perspective, which is the overall piece the overall poster, the overall book, whatever it is, it's the overall layout, which of course we're gonna emphasize more next class about you know, actual layout strategies and, and what makes a good um, poster, et cetera. But it establishes the format, the overall format of the composition, uh, contains some kind of a typographic hierarchy, right? Uh, this could be in different fonts that are being used, different sizes of fonts, different boldness levels of fonts, et cetera so that you have some natural order to the, to the document. So that's the large scale perspective. Micro perspectives are the small details, right? The kerning, the spacing, the ragging, we'll talk about what these are in a second, to ensure a really clean presentation. So we want big scale stuff and small scale stuff, right? Overall document to spacing between individual letter forms. Right? Those are critical, right? Something like this. It's not even in a language that I can read, but it's really nicely done. Right? We have this nice, thin, italicized heading. Below that, uh, we have a nice kind of font that fits well together. We have the use of the small caps here without providing extra emphasis. So it's, just a, it's a really nicely um, executed piece of text. Symmetry and asymmetry can be advantageous or disadvan uh, disadvantageous. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this next class when we do overall graphic design layouts and, and presentations. Symmetry is balance and harmony. Asymmetrical is generally activity and motion or excitement. And so that can be an advantage or a disadvantage depending on what you're trying to do. So it's not that one is better than the other. It just wants you want to think about it uh, in terms of your um, desired outcome. Alignment is the horizontal and vertical position of the typography within the margins. Right? We, we, you probably, if you've worked in Word before, have an understanding that we generally align to the left with a ragged edge on the right. You could align to the left and justify to the right so you have even margins on either side, but it makes the spacing rather wonky. And we'll talk about this live um, in, the, in the world of InDesign in a little bit. And you want to think about what that does for the overall look of the piece right? and how it comes together. So alignment creates the visual relationships between the elements of the design. The type is just as important as an element of the design as the photographs that you're including with the type. 
Typographic color refers to the density of the typographic forms uh, and the elements and their perceived gray value. So I chose this image because you can't really read the text, right? Because it's a little bit too far away on the projector. But if you kind of squint at it, right, you can pull out which paragraphs are darker and which paragraphs are lighter, right? So depending on your font choice and the general density of that paragraph, the size of the font, um, that can play a big role as to what draws your attention or what doesn't draw your attention. So this is as active an element as, say, a photograph that's on the particular page. Right? So a bold paragraph is going to stand out more than uh, a very light paragraph. And that might be an advantage or a disadvantage. So you really want to think about typographic color as it starts to play into your overall uh, design. Type size is measured in points. This is something you're very, very familiar with. Right? Default word 12-point font. Bump it to 12.5 because you need a little extra space, right? Oh, my, my, maybe the opposite is true. My English teacher told me I'm only allowed to have two pages and I have two and a half pages, so I'll shrink it down to like 10 and a half or whatever, okay? Those are known tricks, right? We've all been there. We were all students once too. I remember doing that, okay? Changes in type size result in a nice hierarchy. So even if you're with the same font all the way through your particular document, just changing, you know, 14 point header. 12-point subheader, 10-point actual font can make a really nice transition. So you don't need much more than that. Just the type size um, can, can make a nice hierarchy. Right? You want to develop a proportionate set of scales that you're going to work with right? so that the differences between the, the font sizes feels right. Remember, when you're doing a poster, the fonts are generally going to be a little bit bigger than if you were doing an English paper. Right? So you want a certain uh, rhythm to that, that combination. Case, capital letters versus lowercase letters. Generally speaking, lowercase letters are much more readable than uppercase letters. So if you want somebody to read a long paragraph, the lowercase letters are, are really a nice way of doing that. Uppercase letters emphasize letter to letter recognition. Okay? So if you think about an architectural drawing, for example, do architects write in uppercase letters or do they write in lowercase letters? Uppercase, right? So we, we make everything large, uppercase letters, and we're emphasizing we want you to read exactly what we're saying here, right? Not just kind of glance over and, and get a summary of it. So that's an intentional thing that we're doing, right? Letter to letter recognition. So for example, you guys may have seen something like this, right? If I, if I asked you to read this, you could do it, but you'd really have to concentrate on what all those letters are and what they say, okay? If, on the other hand, I switch this and put it in lowercase form, right? you could read this rather quickly. For example, it doesn't matter what order the letters are in, or the, the letters in a word appear. The only important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. The rest can be a total mess, and you can still read it without a problem. <laughs> My guess is towards the end of this paragraph, you kind of picked up with me, and we're able to read it. Right? It's pretty cool that our brains can do that, because we recognize words. We don't just recognize individual letters. So when we're doing something like this, as long as these first and last letters are in the right place, we recognize the general form of that word, and our brain just interprets the rest, right? which is kind of a cool thing. But this is a perfect example of how lowercase letters make it easy to read. So let's look at example here. Okay, Obviously spelled wrong, uh, with the wrong order here. But e and, uh, the E and the E are in the right place. Right? And we've got some tails. So we recognize that as a word form. If I jump back to this, right, this version of it, right, same spelling, see how it just looks like a big box? There's no word form to it. That's why, in capital letters, we have to do a letter by letter recognition. And it takes, it's a lot harder to read this than it is to read uh, it in a, in a lowercase form. So anyway, hopefully that sinks into you, and you, you understand reading a little bit. So kerning is adjusting the space between individual letters. Okay? It's unrealistic that you would do kerning adjustments on a paragraph because it's just too many uh, individual letters to adjust. But if you were doing a title or a subtitle or something where you had a small set of words, the kerning actually can really matter. And so for example, the easiest way to, to see kerning is to look at something like type. Right? If we were naturally writing this, Right? We would take the T and the Y, right? 
And you would naturally put the y underneath the tail of the t, right? You wouldn't draw t, y, p, e. That just looks funny, doesn't it? Right? So we'd naturally go underneath as we were writing. Not that I have the best handwriting. I don't write like this. I write in all capitals, so it doesn't help, right? But the point is that this adjustment isn't necessarily going to happen at the font level. So most of the time, we're going to have to go in and adjust the kerning between these two letters to slip the Y under the T. And again, too much work to do in a paragraph form, but if you were doing a heading, that would be a critical place. right? Same thing can happen with your capital letters, where the T and the Y are really close together because the two ends come up. right? We add a little bit more space to even these out. And you can kind of see how they feel uneven here, the spacing in between. So the kerning here feels right. So it can happen lowercase letters or uppercase letters. Tracking, on the other hand, is adjusting the space between words, lines, and paragraphs. Okay? So if you really wanted to make your English paper longer, right, instead of using the extended font, see, I'm helping you guys out. You know? There's, there's value to this class. If you really wanted to make that English paper longer, you'd adjust the tracking, right? which is the space between the words, the lines, and the paragraph. Right? So you're, you're, you're kind of extending the whole thing out without making it look awkward. Okay? You're not just making the font a little bit bigger. So we'll talk about how to do this. Okay? It can really help the readability. See, I'm even giving you the excuse for your English teacher. <laughs> I wanted it to be easier for you to read, so I adjusted the tracking to make sure it was just easy for you to read. Okay? So it can greatly improve the readability of the piece. right? If your tracking is too squished together, it's harder to read. If it's a little bit extended, uh, that can help. This will influence that typographic color, the thing I was talking about, of the perceived gray value of your block of text. So if you have uh, more tracking, more spacing in between the words, lines, uh, and paragraphs, that will then make it a little bit lighter in its overall form. Right? You're not going to track lowercase letters. So this is, this is on the paragraph side. It's not on the individual letter form side. Leading is essentially what single double space is in Word. Right? It's just the, the sophisticated way of looking at it. Uh, it's the space between the lines of text. Uh, if you have a tall x height or a heavy typeface, you're going to need more leading than uh, a smaller x height um, or, or a, a lighter typeface. Okay, so you're going to adjust that. InDesign, by default, has uh, what they consider to be the correct spacing or the default leading of a particular paragraph. If you want to move beyond that, I'll show you how to do that uh, and create a little bit more space between your paragraphs. It's actually about 1.2 is what they considered of the, of the, the font size. Anyway. Um, Here's an example of kind of a portfolio piece of work. I know it's a little bit uh, blurry up here, but I think it's a nice combination. Oh, it's too, too light. You can't really see it. Um, it's a nice combination. You can look at the, the, the example images online afterward of the capital letters, the lowercase letters, and kind of how they, they fit together in, a, in an overall uh, composition portfolio style uh, and how they kind of fit together. You can't even see the text, so this is pointless for me to show you. OK, so we're going to move over into the world of InDesign, and I'm going to talk about type from an InDesign context. Okay, So hold on while we switch over, and then we'll keep going. OK, so today we're going to work on the world of InDesign uh, relating specifically to typefaces. And we're going to use a body of text by Vitruvius, uh, who was a Roman architect way back when. Uh, but he wrote 10 books on architecture. And um, the 10 books on architecture I have a copy of here, obviously translated into English so that we can read it. The cool thing about this book is it's completely annotated. So the back half of the book has all the images of exactly what he's talking about in it. So um, I, I bring this in just so that you guys can see um, you know, kind of examples of, of this. This is very old school. Maybe it corresponds to your history class. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Uh, but if you want to see what uh, the books actually mean. This is a really good uh, example of that. We're going to use the, t the, the first chapter of the 10 books on architecture to discuss type, because I don't want you to have to type an English paper just to use it. Okay? But this is a good example of text that we can, that we can work from. 
So uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a new document. This new document is going to be letter sized and it's going to be in its regular orientation, so in portrait orientation. I'm going to change my margins to be at zero again. right? And then I'll go ahead and say OK. And I'll end up with my page, right? my 8.5 by 11 page. Once again, I'd like the units not to be in picas, but to be in something that I can understand. So I'll right click on this little crosshair and change my units to be in inches. And so now I can see that, yes, my document is 8.5 inches by 11 inches. Okay. I'm also going to go ahead and open up the Digital Tools for Architects website here and go to today's exercise. And I've included for you a Word file that has the first chapter of Vitruvius in it. So I'm going to go ahead and go to exercises here. Yep, I have to log in. My bad. Hold on a second. All right. So right here, Vitruvius 10 Books on Architecture, Chapter 1. It's a Word document file. I'm going to go ahead and save link as so that it's a Word document. I'll put it on my flash drive here. Uh, and we'll put it into today's. That is not today's exercise. And I'll go ahead and save chapter one as a Word document. OK. So now that I have that established, I'm going to go ahead and start to work with text in the world of InDesign. And so I'm going to go over here and I'm going to click on the T tool, right, which gets me the text box. And then I'll go ahead and create uh, a couple text boxes. So let's do one that goes across here, something like that. And then I'll do another one down here, about like that. And we'll do another one down here, about like that. Okay, So I quickly created three text boxes. They're just empty. And now, because InDesign works with referenced linked files, I can go to File and then Place, and I can bring in that Word document. But before I do that, I want to select the first box that I want the text to fall into. So let's say I want it to fall right here. I'm going to go to File and then Place. And I'll go into my Exercise 110 folder. There's my Word document, my Chapter 1. And I'll go ahead and st click Open. And it brings up this little dialog box that says, I'm missing fonts. Uh, one of the reasons that I've never gone and corrected the fact that we're missing the font is I want you to have to deal with this, because it will happen to you as well. Uh, so it says it's missing a font. I can click on Find Font and Substitute. It says it's missing Times New Roman. Right? So I can substitute that with times, maybe, Times New Roman here. So this one is called Times Roman, not Times New Roman. So anyway, so we'll go ahead and change all. And this one is the Times New Roman there. And we want this one to be bold, change all, and then done. So you see that when I did that, my text stopped being highlighted in pink right, and is now highlighted uh, as it is normal. Okay? So I was able to place the Word file directly into that text box. Okay? Now the Word file itself, if I were to open it, obviously has the whole chapter in it. So let me, right? So here's the Word file. You can see that it contains the chapter. Okay. This text box that I just dropped it in 
obviously doesn't contain all of the, the Word file. No surprise, it's not big enough. But do you see how I get this little red box at the bottom here? This little like red box with a plus sign in it? That little indicator says that there is text that goes beyond what can fit inside this frame. So if I use my black arrow, my selection tool, and I click on that little red icon, you can see that it loads up the next piece of this Word document. Okay, and I get a little preview. And then if I click into this text box, for example, right, the text continues right into that text box. Okay? Furthermore, I could click on it again, and I could continue it into this text box. Okay? So kind of nice to be able to, to automatically flow. Now, it would be, you, could you do this? Let's say you did it in Photoshop. Could you do this? Sure. Okay? But one of the advantages here is that if I resize the text box, if I make that a little bit larger, the text automatically flows and changes into my document. If this was the wrong size and I wanted to move that over a little bit, you could see that it adjusts as I go through the document. Does that make sense? So it can be a really powerful all right, way of adjusting text. In fact, it's probably powerful enough so that when you do your next history paper, you might choose to do the final layout in InDesign rather than in something like Word, right? because you have a little bit more flexibility. Specifically, if we wanted to work our way around some kind of an image. So let's say that I take this, and I'm going to delete that. And I'll take this piece, and we'll make it wider. Something like that. Let's put this up like that. And you see how I'm, I'm, I'm making adjustments, and the text is automatically flowing through it. Now let's say I wanted to drop an image into this. Right? We could create an image frame, say something like this. And I could go to File, and then Place, and I could put in some kind of an image. Now I'm just going to pick something from last class. We'll drop this in. Let me go to Fitting, and we'll fill frame proportionally. There we go. Now right now, the text goes behind this particular image, but if I click on it, right, I'm going to change out of my essentials mode up here in the right into typography. That's what we're doing today, so it's beneficial to go there. Once I'm in typography mode, there's a button for text wrap, which I can click on, and now I can specify, do I want the text to go around my particular object? So let's say I want it to go around my object. And now it's going to adjust the text to go around the object that I placed on the, on the screen. The cool thing about this is if I moved my object, the text is going to move around that particular object no matter where I put it. Right? Anybody ever tried to do images in Word? Right? It's horrible, isn't it? Especially if you try to put more than one image on a page. Okay? Well, guess what? In the world of InDesign, I can put as many images as I want, and the text will just automatically wrap around it. Right? Sometimes you need a little, let's say it was on this side over here, something like that. See how this is really tight to it? Okay? These represent the borders, so I can actually add some padding around my particular image so that the text is never too close to my image. Okay? So again, very, very usable all right, in terms of how this, how this works itself out. Okay, so let's start to talk about the text itself a little bit more. So let me move this. I'm going to move this up a little bit higher on the page. I'll move this up higher on the page as well. Make sure it's centered. And then I want to start looking at, let's zoom in. Let's start looking at this chapter one. Okay. So remember, we talked a lot about um, adjusting the um, tracking, the space between individual letters. So let's zoom in so that we're just looking at chapter one. So if I were looking at this as a font, right, the, the spacing here is a little bit awkward. Right? And we can kind of tell that. So if I put my cursor in between, and I come up to this ribbon up here at the top, right, I have a variety of options. The first option here is my tracking. Right? And I get a little line in between those two. That's how I know it's the tracking. Uh, this is the. Did I mix those up? Is it kerning or tracking? I always forget. The kerning is the overall spacing in the words, which is here. So let's look at tracking first. right? And let me go ahead and adjust the tracking. And I'll go in between each letter form here. Let's 
wrong direction. It's supposed to go up. have the tracking adjusted correctly in between those words. I think these are still a little bit too far apart here. So it's definitely visual. You have to go through it okay, on an individual letter by letter basis. So that's the tracking. We'll get to the kerning uh, a little bit later when we get to the actual paragraphs. So we'll skip that for right now. But I do have some other options. So first thing here is I can change the font altogether. So I'm in Times New Roman right now. If I click on this little triangle, I can pick any example font that I wanted. Right, I can pick something like this. Notice, though, the tracking changes when I change the font. Right, so we would want to pick the font first. Right, so let's say something like that. Right, again, the tracking changes a little bit. And it really doesn't matter what I end up picking. I'm just showing, showing you different examples. Okay? Likewise, this, this particular example, I have a regular and I have a bold. If I picked the Times New Roman, if we went back to Times New Roman, if I can find it, right? Built into this font, I have regular italic, bold, and bold italic, right? So I have different um, samples, right? And it's not just an italicized version, right? They've actually adjusted some of the the the, the um, letter forms themselves. Anyway. But I can also adjust right here the size. So we're at 16 point. Maybe I'll go to 24 point to say chapter 1. Below that, right, this is the leading or the spacing between letters. So I told you it has a default value. So I have a 24 point font. The leading is 28.8 points. Okay? So it's a little bit more than single spaced. I can adjust this value either using one of the presets or I can type in a value. If I want, went to double spaced, I would go to 48 point, and that would then uh, change. Now, in this particular example, um, we don't have lots of paragraph of text. We would see that much better uh, down here in the paragraph form. So if I went here, it's 16 point font, and if I went to 32, right, oh, I got to select the whole thing here. We'll get to the paragraphs in just a second. If I selected this, and I went to 32, right? We get double spaced. So you see how I calculated double spaced? That's why it's called double spaced. Anyway, the default value is the one that's in parentheses. So if I went back, well, we'll leave it like that. You get the idea. Okay, I'm just trying to go through my options here. Uh, so we have a few other things that are available to us. If we want to do superscripts and subscripts, we can do that. There's a strike through option that's available as well. As we continue on, I can adjust a few other things. Um, I could adjust the position of an individual letter. So in this case, this would stretch um, one individual letter to be taller. right? So it's in percentages. So if I went to 150%, for example, that one letter would get stretched to be taller. Uh, it's not very common that people do that in practice, but it is available to us. I can also adjust the vertical position of this letter. This would be if you want to do like an exponent or something. You could do it. Uh, or if you wanted to do first, if you were doing like 1st, something like that, I could take the st and adjust it to be high, something like that, within the context of the, te the, the text itself. Make sense? Yeah? OK, so that's the, the superscript if you wanted to change. I could change the width of an individual character. So if they are here, I could say, let's do it at 200%, and the r gets fatter, okay, wider. Again, less common that people would do that. If the font didn't have an italicized version, I could take a particular piece of text and add a degree of slant to it. Now again, it would be far better, instead of doing this, to use the italicized version, because we talked about the letter forms themselves are better. So let's take that back to be at 0. OK, so that gets us through the bulk of the, the individual character options. 
All right, as we come over into this section, we have more of the paragraph options. So let me come down here to the paragraph. We press control zero to see the whole thing a little bit. We press control plus so we can zoom in. And so this particular section is the paragraph options. So my justification options are available. If I wanted it right justified, for example, I could change uh, to right justified. There it is, sorry. Right, left justified, centered. Right, this should be relatively obvious. Okay. I can also choose, let's keep it left justified. I can choose to indent the whole paragraph. So this first option is to indent the whole paragraph. There it is. Again, it flows through all of my, my text. So as this gets longer, it pushes down. Uh, I can indent the right side of the paragraph for some reason. I've never found a need to do that in practice. I could indent the first line of the paragraph. I could also indent it negatively so that it goes backwards. Right? Or I could indent it you know, forward, depending on, on what you were trying to do. Um, this would be to indent the last line of the paragraph. Again, don't quite understand the use of that, but it's available to us if we wanted to. Okay, uh, okay so this next option here would be what's called a drop cap. And a drop cap controls whether I want the first number here to take up two lines of text. So if I say I want it to take up two lines of text, hold on, I have to select the paragraph first, right? I want a drop cap, right? That is one or two or three lines of text. So there it is at two lines of text. And I can control how many characters are part of that drop cap. You guys have seen this done in, in books and stuff before, okay? That's called a drop cap. Um, I can choose on the paragraph, and again, I have to select the whole paragraph, I can choose to hyphenate the paragraph or to not hyphenate the paragraph, depending on whether I want that or not. Magazines tend to be hyphenated. Books tend not to be hyphenated. Food for thought. Okay? So all of this is great, right? but it's kind of difficult in the sense that I've done all this work to one paragraph, but I didn't do it to any of the other paragraphs. Okay? So in reality, when we're working in the world of InDesign, yes, doing some individual work on particular paragraphs is useful, but many times it's useful to save the settings that we have so that we can use them over and over again. And so we do that using something called a paragraph style and something called a character style. So let's start with uh, character style. So over here on the right column, again, I have typography selected as my, my choice uh, workspace here. I'm going to click on character styles, and right now I have no character styles. It says none. If I click on this new icon down here at the bottom, I get something called character style one, and I can rename this character style one uh, to be something, I don't know, first number, right, or subheading or, or whatever. And if I double click on it, we bring up the character style options. And so in the character style options, I can go to basic character formats, and this is where, for example, I could pick the font that I wanted to pick. So let's say I wanted to do uh, Berlin. I could specify that the font needed to be larger. It needed to be 24 point. Um, I could specify what the leading on that particular needed to be. Right? Again, we have access to kerning and tracking, case and position. Case would mean that I could do small caps or all caps. Small caps, remember, are x height capital letters. All caps would be full cap height letters. Okay, um, I can control position. Do I want it to be a superscript, etc.? I could also turn on and have it underlined, etc. I can come down here and do advanced character formats. Probably not much you're going to do there, but I could change the character color, right? So, for example, I could make that uh, particular character a particular color, right? Maybe I'll make it blue. For oh, let's make it red. Okay, we could come down here. Not a lot there. Underline if I wanted that on. If I want to strike through on, etc. Okay, so I'll go ahead and say OK. And that then saves my first number character style. So what I can do is I can go through my document and anywhere I need that character style, I can click on first number and it changes the font, the color, and everything that I've set up. And I can use that over and over again on any place in the document. So maybe I would set up a character style for bold text, 
right? And I'll go into character formats. And I might actually specify a font, right? Let's go back to Times New Roman. And we're going to keep the size here at 16 point, right? If, by the way, I put nothing in here, this character style won't change the size of the font from what it's currently selected as. Okay, so if I put nothing in there, that's fine. If I if I got the if I deleted the font, I don't know if it's going to let us delete the font. No, it's not going to. Yes, it will. There we go. I could specify that no matter what the font is, I want it to just be bold, right? Which is probably the best way of doing this. Okay, we'll get rid of the leading here as well. And I could come through and I could do something with with the color, for example, if I wanted to. So I'm going to go ahead and say okay for bold text, and then I'm going to specify that this is bold text and that this is bold text, and that this is bold text. And it looks like my options didn't quite fix, so that's OK. So let me go in and adjust bold text. So part of the, uh, so I'm double clicking on it to get into here. Let me go back, and I want the color to go back to black. And when I do that, you see that it updates. And it updates at all the places in my document. So if I use these character styles throughout, let's say I was doing a, a history paper, right? And I decided that I really didn't want the bold to be as bold, if I have it set up in a character style, when I change the character style, it'll go back through my whole document and make those changes, which is a big uh, advantage. So let me come back in here. I didn't like the, the font that was picked. So let me go back to basic character styles. Let me go back to a Times New Roman. And I do want it bold, but I wanted the size to be 16. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And you see that it goes back and adjusts in all the places that I've used it. Okay? I could make this one bold text as well. Okay? So that's one of the big advantages. Um, again, if I picked another thing and I said bold text, it would apply to that field. So just like with character styles, I can also do paragraph styles. Okay? So let's say that I like this paragraph style where I had uh, a drop cap and I had double spacing uh, of my lines. I could come back and I could select this paragraph. We could go into paragraph styles. I could create a new paragraph style. And then I could come in and I could do a lot of the same edits. Now notice that I still have basic character formats because I can override an individual character style with this paragraph style. right? Or I can ignore that altogether. I'm going to switch this back to my Times New Roman. It. There we go. And back to 16 point. And then we'll continue uh, down here. And I'm going to do some other things with it. Okay. So if I come all the way down to um, let's see, indents and spacing, you see that my alignment is left justified. I could do my left indent at a particular value. I could do my first indent at a negative value so that it's stuck over. Uh, and I can update this, say OK. And we're going to see it populate into this particular paragraph. So if I continued editing, right? let's go back into my character color. I want it back to black. Uh, let's say that I wanted it to be hyphenated. I can check hyphenation. My justification, if I wanted to work, work with that. Drop caps and nested styled. I want it to be two lines with two characters. And I'll say OK. And so now we're starting to see that this is starting to match up with this. Okay? But obviously, the, the drop cap is still using the character style that turned it red. Now, the advantage here is I could click into the third paragraph, and I could come down and click on paragraph style 1 here, and it would match. The number here doesn't match because this had a character style rather than a paragraph style applied to it. So I'd have to go in and come back to my character styles and I'd have to apply the first number character style, in which case that would match as well. Okay? So the, the character styles and the paragraph styles are probably the most powerful way of working with um, your documents because they allow you to do um, things over and over again very, very easily. So you might establish something for a particular uh, indent of a quotation or something, and then you can use that over and over again in your style. Maybe you would do one for the um, you know, when you had to do a work cited in a paragraph, whatever that was, maybe that would have a specific style, which would allow you to go back and make those adjustments. So it can be very, very useful uh, as you're starting to set this stuff up. Okay? 
So I think we've covered essentially everything that you need to cover here. The stuff that's available in this upper ribbon is also available under paragraph and character. The same stuff is available. Um, the, the below the styles is the easiest way of creating something to reuse over and over again. So for what you're doing today, let me just make sure that I've covered everything that I want you to work on today. Oh, I have one more thing to cover. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. I want you to set up just one page of, of a Vitruvius text. I want you to play around with these paragraph and character styles so that you become very comfortable with them. You will want to use these in your portfolio uh, because it will make changing fonts and stuff much, much easier. But the one other thing that I wanted to talk about is on occasion, you end up wanting to create uh, or use a font that isn't available on one of these computers. Uh, and so I'm going to show you how to um, download and then ultimately use a different font. Um, I need to find a font first. So font squirrel is, is a great uh, website for free fonts. And so you can uh, download almost any of these depending on uh, what your, or your particular look is. Um, let me go ahead and download this one, for example. Um, is it going to actually? Let's go back. That one's going to make me do some kind of checkout thing. All right, so how about this one? There we go. So that one downloads as a zip file. I'm going to go ahead and show it and then copy this to my flash drive and then extract it on my flash drive. So this would be a great place to have a resources folder called fonts for any fonts that you want to use over and over again. Um, let me go ahead and extract this right into this folder. And there we are. Okay, So there's the font. Now, unfortunately, because these computers are locked, you can't just install it on one of these computers. So we have to have a way of, of temporarily installing it. And there's a great portable application that's available. Uh, I have a link to it on the course website that will allow you to temporarily install a font. If I go to Tutorials, Digital Life um, 0 0.15, the AMP Font Viewer, this will walk you through how to, um, how to install it. I'm going to go ahead and go to its actual page, and then I'll click on Download Now. From the external mirror one is fine. And there it is. So once again, I'll show this in folder. Let me copy it. And this would go into my flash drive. Um, again, in my resources, in my portable applications folder, excuse me. And then I'll go ahead and paste. And we'll extract this as well. And so what this does is it presents a little tiny application that when I double click and open it up, it will let me load in a font that isn't on these computers, just temporarily for me to use. So I'm going to go to the tab for not installed fonts. I'm going to go to my flash drive. And I'm going to go to my resources folder. And then to my fonts folder. And there's that font that I downloaded. And I'll come down here and I'll say install font temporarily. Yes, and so that just added it to my um, font list. Now, because this is just kind of running in the background, instead of closing this app, I have to just minimize it so that I can keep working. Um, and that font should be available in InDesign. Every once in a while, it's not available um, when you first go to select it. And I'll see if it is. I think that was it, right? What was it called? Caution script. No, nope, wrong one. Started with a K, but I was wrong. So it's not available here. So I'm going to go ahead and go to File, Save. Save my InDesign file. So this is my exercise 110 file. We'll click Save. I'm going to close InDesign. Again, not closing this, we're just leaving this open. And I'll go back and I'll open InDesign again. 
It'd be great if I could find it. And I'll open my file again. And now I can come back and it will be loaded. Is that it? No, there it is. Right? And so there's that font that I downloaded. Okay? So you can see that I was able to load in whatever custom font I wanted. So if you have a particular font that you like for your poster or something like that, feel free to go find it and then use it, right? just because it's not on these folders. Uh, uh, there are several really fantastic websites. Font Squirrel is one of them uh, that offer lots and lots of free fonts um, for you to use that are just they're great different uh, fonts. So something like this is a, is a good example. Um, just as kind of a headline font. And you can keep looking at what other people have come up with. Uh, we can go to the hot category, hottest today. So you can see what people have been downloading. And so you can see there's a variety of different uh, fonts that are available. And that can really make a big difference when you're doing your design project. Right? Many of the best graphic designers have their own list of fonts that they tend to use um, over and over again. Okay? Are there any questions? No? All right. I'll turn you loose. Um, you're going to post a JPEG of this single page. So just as you did before, once you get it established the way you want, you'll go to File, Export, change this to JPEG, Save. Make sure here quality is at least high or maximum, resolution at 300, and then Export. This is what you'll post uh, on the course website today. You only need to do one page. And we'll talk about multi-page documents as we go forward. All right.